at the end of the day, I think when we walk into the classroom, we have to make everybody feel inclusive. I think that's that's a good solution to have and, and make people feel welcome. Today we're going to talk to Dr. Ernest Burnett. Dr. Burnett is an instructor in speech, but he's also the liaison for diversity and inclusion at ACC. Welcome, Dr. Burnett. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. You and I have been trying to do this for <laughs> quite a while since last year <laughs> and and now it's finally happening so I'm, I appreciate being here appreciate you having me you recently conducted this survey on campus among students mm-hmm. uh, tell me more about that survey at least and, and before you talk about the results talk mm-hmm. tell me more about what the survey is kind of how it was conducted and, and kind of what the purpose for it is we got to go all the way back to the implementation of the position of liaison for diversity and inclusion so the last strategic plan was in its fifth year and part of that fifth year strategic plan was to begin to promote diversity equity and inclusion here at ACC and it was ironically during the whole George Floyd thing and I think a lot of people on campus assumed that it was a knee-jerk reaction by the institution when it really wasn't and so it was actually within the fifth year. It was 6.1 something. Right. And then the strategic plan was first launched in 2016. That's right. And it was developed before that, about a year and a half before that. Mm -hmm. Um, So a lot of those goals were laid out long before that. And then uh, with that, the liaison for diversity position came and I was uh, the person that was chosen to, to lead that charge. And we had our first climate survey, if you recall, that HITS climate survey, which Mm -hmm was the entire institution as a whole. It was during COVID, and so we didn't get as many of the response, as many people to respond as we did, but most of the people that did respond were students. Mm -hmm. But we did get enough data to just kind of get a a feel for how people felt on campus about about DEI. And then the fall convocation, if you can recall, it was centered around diversity, equity, and inclusion. We had some really good presentations from people. And then from that, ACC, along with other institutions, universities, and colleges, went into this Houston GPS or Guided Pathway to Success, something that I mentioned in the presentation. So there's 10 of us involved in that. We were part of workshops, and this was done by USC's uh, Race and Equity Center. And that's how that particular survey came to be. USC was behind that survey. And so it's a national, well, it stands for National Assessment of Collegiate Campus Climate. So all of the campuses that were a part of Houston HGPS, and so all of them actually participated in it uh, as well as us, and we got those results back December, late November, early December. And then Dr. Sheffman and myself looked at the results and so decided that it would be good for the campus to know the results of the survey. So that's how the survey came to be, and it was out of the... The purpose of it for, not just for ACC, but for everybody was because of the climate that we were in at the time with all of the racial tension. And so students make up the institution. And so therefore, we wanted to, well, they wanted to find out how students felt with regards to their inclusion and things like that as far as campus is concerned. So that's how all of it came to be. When, Sam, when was it conducted? Uh, I was conducted in 2021. Okay. I would say from either the summer to November or somewhere alone in there. We got the results back in November. Okay. Yeah. How do you feel, you know, before we even get to the results, how do you mm-hmm. feel like the the national climate with racial tensions may have impacted the results? If at all. I mean, well, I, I think that's a good question. It's a legitimate question. I think that Logically speaking, probably so, but probably really wouldn't know that through numbers. Right. You would know that through narratives. Right. It would it would depend on how these students were feeling even before this racial tension, yes. and then we could get those narratives. But as far as the numbers were concerned, I I think the climate itself certainly could impact the re, the results of um, of the st- uh, stats from the survey. Absolutely, yeah. So, mm-hmm. so tell me about the, the survey results. What, what, what were some of the things that y'all found? Well, first, uh, it was six content areas that the students were surveyed, and I'll just go over all six of them. 
uh, mattering and affirmation. So I'll, I'll explain all of these content areas. Yeah. Cross-racial engagement, that was the second one. Racial learning and literacy was the third one. Encounters with racial stress was the fourth one. Appraisals of institutional commitment was the fifth one. And the last one was impacts of external environments. And so I can define those real, real sure. short definitions yeah. for all six of them. Mattering and affirmation is just basically when a student is in the class, do they feel like they matter? And do they feel like the instructors affirm them? They affirm their presence. They make them feel welcomed. That kind of, that that they're going to support them in terms of of when they enroll in the class, while they're going through the class, and the outcome. You know. So, what USC Race and Equity Center found from us, this was the glaring result, because uh, POC stands for people of color and then white students. Specifically, the Hispanic and Latino students did not feel like that they mattered or they were being affirmed by white professors. That was the glaring result from that one. But Asians and whites felt that like they mattered and they, that they were being affirmed. And the conclusion was that since this is a Hispanic-serving institution, we certainly don't want that to be something that gets in the way of them succeeding in the classroom. And so, whereas with the professors of color, they didn't feel that way. So I thought that was really glaring result from that. And I had shared that with the campus during that presentation. You know, and, and I know these were these were graded on terms of... Yeah, it was, it was based on like a Likert scale. Yeah, okay. like a Likert scale, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Were you surprised by that? <sighs> was I surprised by that? Not really, and this is the reason why, because a lot of times faculty do go into classrooms engaging in self-fulfilling prophecies. Mm -hmm. And if, if a group of people are continuously being told that they're not going to succeed, then they internalize that, and then they go into the classroom, and, and if that professor doesn't display that that student matters, then it almost fulfills the prophecy. So. No, I wasn't really surprised about that at all. It's, I think it's all about perception, how a student feels about when they're in the classroom. Do they really believe that they matter? Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, the second one was, do students of color and white students feel comfortable about talking about race in the classroom? That's what cross-engagement is. 28% of the white students did not feel encouraged to talk about race. In fact, uh, the white students and students who said that there were two that they were two or more races, they both felt uncomfortable about talking about race in the classroom. Whereas Hispanics, Asians and blacks did they didn't really have issue with, with talking about race. <laughs> You're laughing about that. So. You find that interesting at all? Uh, no? I don't find that surprising at all. Really? Because when I talk to white students, uh, uh, that's not what they think about every no, day. No, that's, yeah, <laughs> that's definitely the case. No, they don't think about that every day. But do you, are you concerned at all, though, that even though if, there, if you have students who, white students who are thinking about it and want to talk about it and they feel like they can't, do you feel like there's a dialogue there that's not taking place Ab that could possibly take place? Absolutely. And one of the things that I had mentioned in the solution is that I think that based on these results that teachers should encourage those discussions. Now, if you talk to teachers, generally they don't like to pull things from the sky and say, okay, we're going to we're going to put this in here, and then it just seems out of place. Well, and some of them feel, I'm sure, ill-equipped to that, talk about it. So. That, that, too. And so I think we have to learn how to, how to talk about it within the context of a discussion because then in that way it seems more fluid and it doesn't seem so out of place that it would make the instructor uncomfortable, but it would also not make the students feel uncomfortable. I... I talk about race because I really don't have any choice in the subject that I that I teach and and so there are ways to do that 
There's ways well, to do it. Well, it kind of also has to be done in a way that's relevant to the content the, they're teaching uh, as well, I'm assuming. The, yeah, that too. So a simple example, and this is not to, to pick on the math people here, but you can talk about race and math because when you talk about success rates when it comes to, to ethnicities, well, they give you the data all the time in who's not achieving success in, in math, who's taking developmental math as opposed to other groups. And so uh, a teacher can come in and affirm that those students, listen, I, I don't care who you are, mm -hmm. you're going to succeed in this class. And I'm going to ensure that you succeed in this class. So it's not really a s discussion about race per se. It's just showing uh, the it's students. It's an acknowledgment. No, that's right, they, that you matter. Yeah, I mean, I look, I didn't do good in math. I had to take. I, I, I failed <laughs> miserably in math. <laughs> I, I two C's my way out of trigonometry and algebra <laughs> one. So I was happy about that. <laughs> but, yeah, so it's, uh, it's internalizing things, yeah. So the third one was racial learning and literacy. The most, uh, so what this means basically is, again, it's kind of like cross-racial engagement or teachers having these discussions about race in the classroom. Are they having these discussions? And we just talked about it. It has to be within the context. And again, uh, students of color felt like that they weren't talking about race on campus. Again, white students, really, they don't think about race every right. day. So, so those numbers weren't, weren't surprising. I was going to say, and when you compare it to the previous question, which was, you know, people of color are much more comfortable talking about race, mm -hmm. and then they feel like their professors are not talking about race. Right. It creates a friction, I would imagine, with a lot of these students because – they they want to talk about it, right. but the instructors don't, you know, yeah. or or the, the instructors are just not, you know, wouldn't mm -mm. say don't, but they're not. Yeah, so. I, I think I, I think the word not would probably be a better word of choice for that. Yeah, they're not they're not talking about it, and then when they when they do, it probably is not. Maybe it catches the students off guard or something, and, and so it almost makes them feel like you know they're being picked on, you know, so. <laughs> But not not picked on, but you know that they're being singled out. Individual, you, uh, yeah, that, that's right. That out. they can be singled out. Yeah. The next one was encounter with racial stress. In other words, did students of color or white students feel like they were micro aggressively or overtly discriminated against in the classroom or on campus in general? And the overwhelming results were again that students of color with the exception of white students and Asian students did not experience this, but Hispanics and black students did. The interesting thing about this, and I just think this is with most students when they do have clashes with teachers is retaliation, but this is based on a racial situation. And what I discovered is that teachers have three types of power. They have legitimate power, by virtue of their position. Mm -hmm. They have reward power, they have the ability to reward the student, and they have the power to punish them. That's a lot of power in the classroom. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine. Especially when it's a class that affects your future. That's well. right, and see, so it's like they can give it and they can take it away. And so if a student says something that, that they you know, disagree with when it comes to some microaggressiveness in the classroom, they may fear that that teacher is going to use that against them. And, you know, I don't know this for a fact. I've been here for a long time, and administrations that have been here at ACC, they're not going to tolerate that kind of behavior in the classroom where a teacher blatantly retaliates against the student. They're, they're not going to support that. And so the fifth one was appraisals of institutional commitment, which just basically means is the institution supporting diversity, equity, and inclusion on campus. Asians and white students felt like they were. Blacks and Hispanic students said not enough. So they gave them like, it wasn't a Likert scale, it gave them the, the phrases and words okay. kind of thing. So it was, it was that and the activities. Whites and Asians felt like, yeah, the, the campus is doing enough. Because <laughs> they, see see the the, they see Hispanic Heritage Week yeah. and they just assume, oh, okay, well, yeah, yeah. we're doing plenty. And yeah. Hispanic students may not feel that way. Yeah, so. and so 
and so and, and black's not enough either so this is like when i think that well the neat thing about faculty hiring or at least disproportionately not being hired is that one of our hgps teams their project is addressing uh the hiring of minority faculty as part of their project so it's going to be interesting to see what what they do with that and we have a we have a project as well so overwhelmingly everybody they ask the question about were they getting support from COVID from the institution overwhelmingly everybody agreed okay. in fact 100 percent of the black students in the survey said that yes they got all the support that they needed most of the students over 80 percent of them said that they were getting the kind of support that they were getting from the institution so so we all should um, be happy about that and impact on external environments was the last one and that had to do with whether or not when students are outside of ACC but they're engaging in activities that that are related to ACC did they experience any discrimination in five percent of the students said that that they have experienced that so that's that's small but it's still a big deal but you well any percentage is something that needs to be addressed abs I mean. absolutely and so we want to know what those things are and you know what's interesting about climate surveys is i think that people think that the bad is being unveiled in an institution when really it's not that way at all it's it's really just measuring the climate of of the campus when it comes to diversity equity and inclusion and it's certainly not to say that ACC is is a horrible place. I think when people see, hear results like this, they just automatically assume the worst when when these things are to help us uh, from administration, uh, staff, and faculty to help students because at the end of the day, they're the ones who matter because without without them, we we don't have work. Holistically speaking, mm -hmm. looking at the entirety of the survey, which is a, it's a complicated thing to do because there yeah. were a lot of questions on it and a lot of um, variations in the data. Mm -hmm. But looking at it from a complete picture, what were some of the things that kind of stood out to you that maybe you didn't think would be a certain way or things that caught you off guard or something um, that may have surprised you? That's a good question. I don't think that there were any glaring surprises. I just like the fact that we engaged in two climate surveys, and that has never been done before here. So I didn't see anything glaring about the results from the survey, but I can say, and Dr. Sheffman can probably attest to this, but, and I'm not speaking for her, but generally speaking, based on a lot of data from climate surveys, white students don't wake up and think about race oh they don't have to <laughs> yeah that's right problem. that's, that's <laughs> right so other than that there was really no surprises to me now that we have the data what are we going to do about it you know and i think that's important and one of the things that that we plan on doing is uh, partnering with haley collins so we can put some um, workshops together because there was some faculty in the chat during the presentation wanted to know like you had mentioned earlier how do you teach this how do you teach this in the classroom how do you keep it in its proper context without alienating anybody and so uh, we're going to partner and figure out research and figure out how we can offer that to, to faculty well, what are some of the other solutions I mean based on the results that, I, mean, that's, that, I mean, that's not the only one. I mean, yeah, that's, that's, that's one solution. I think, I think the first day of class mattering and affirming students is so important. I know that, that faculty sometimes can be overwhelmed with their own work. But at the end of the day, I think when we walk into the classroom, we have to make everybody feel inclusive. I think that's, that's a good solution to have and, and make people feel welcomed. The other thing that I think... The, the survey showed is that the institution is in support of diversity, equity, and inclusion, but, but obviously we still have some work to do in terms of, of faculty hiring because of the disproportionate amount of faculty as it relates to the student population. So that's something else that, that I think the survey 
uh, brought out and and so we do have a solution at least to that where the other group is going to present their their project to the to the campus the other glaring thing to me was having a discussion about race you know you would think like in a history class you, you can't even avoid talking no. about race <laughs> or, especially in american history yeah that, uh, that that's right and so uh, and i'm not saying the history t- people don't have those discussions but like to what extent and the the level of comfort that you want people to have I think, to me, those are the more immediate solutions that can be done. How can we make students feel welcome? How can we make them feel like that they matter? Uh, How can we make faculty look like the student population? And the other glaring thing was talking about race, Mm -hmm. not being afraid to have those discussions, yeah. So those are the three major things that I got from it. And those things, I think, those solutions can be immediately implemented. Yeah. So you've been teaching here for? 28 and a half years, and <laughs> that's, a, that's a long time. In all that time? Not, not as long as, I'm not going to mention folks' names, <laughs> but not as long as some people <laughs> here, but yeah. In all the time that you've been here, what any changes have you seen in the way um, racism or race is handled on campus? I think that's a really good question. I, I can say this, that one of the things that I appreciated when the former VP of HR came in, uh, Karen Edwards, she instituted a hiring process we didn't have a hiring process here at not not to that degree and so with that hiring process not only did we increase the pool when you increase the pool you increase it'd be a diverse pool and it doesn't matter the race john the proverbial cream will rise to the top no matter the race but everybody has to have an equal opportunity to be able to rise to that and what I've seen since I've been here over the last five years is more diversity than we've ever had here. And I, I think I've been here for ten years, and I was okay. very much agree with you. And that's yeah. in the short amount of time that I've been here. Yeah. So. And and ACC should be commended for that. And I think I mean, and one thing about Karen is that she had the support of the administration. Now, a lot of people may not have liked the process because change is not always comfortable for some people, but. This is the most diversity that I've seen here at ACC when it comes to uh, administration, staff, and faculty. So, I don't know if you're going to be here another 28 years, <laughs> but you know, at least in the future going forward, mm-hmm. what are some things you think we would have to see in order to improve student performance mm. among students of color? Making them feel inclusive and as faculty or even, you know, staff, because, you know, the onboarding process is important to students too. So a lot of times we have a tendency to to have these, these stereotypical beliefs about student success, who's going to succeed, who's not going to succeed. And that's kind of in the whole educational environment and institution in that you start grouping people and then you talk about who based on numbers, who will succeed and who will not succeed. And if you continue to embed that into persons of color, they have their first negative experience in college, like maybe a bad grade. Right. And then they internalize that and say, well, I guess, you know, the numbers that are it was, right. That it was expected. That it was expected of me to fail anyway. And then that same teacher is looking at and le- I mean, let's face it, teachers look at names, mm-hmm. and sometimes they draw conclusions in terms of who that person may be based on their ethnicity. And then they themselves even assume that this person is not going to do well. And so rather than affirming them and making them feel like that they matter, well, they may just push them to the side. So I'm not saying I don't know how teachers work in the classroom. I'm but just, this is where people will talk about, this is where it is at a systemic level. Yeah. It's not just a 
person to person interaction. This mm-hmm. is where it's built into the system. Th- that's right. Yeah. And then that's a yeah, you pretty much said it succinctly right there. And I think that we as as faculty, we don't we don't we shouldn't engage in that kind of thought process and say things like, Well, you know, this person is not college material. Everybody is college material because it's really about putting the work in. If you put the work in, you're going to succeed in college, but everybody work ethic is different. Just like any teacher, every teacher here has gone to college. Their work ethic was not the same as everybody else's. You know, procrastination is something else. So if you, <laughs> if well, you I ask know I had te- to fight for it. So <laughs> if you ask a teacher, have you ever procrastinated when you were in college? I think we're going to get an well, overwhelming. Procrast- they really. procrastinate as teachers too. So. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> I think that would be a a good first step for us moving forward. Thank you for inviting me to this and also thanking the college for making me a part of this whole diversity, equity, and inclusion experience. And and always say to people who who may have some some resistance to the change is that uh, it's, it's here. And it's for the better of not only the institution, but it's for the betterment of the community as well. Everyone. Yeah, everyone. That's right. Well, thanks for coming by today. I appreciate it. Wow, thank you so much, John. To read these stories and more, visit allencollege.edu.